Welcome to the Stony Brook Small Business Development Center. I am the Regional Associate Director here. And what we do is we help small business. That's exactly what we do. It's a very <coughs> simple mission. We are here to help the small businesses of Long Island. We work one-on-one -on -one with our clients. We help with business plans. We help with marketing. We help existing clients and startups with whatever it is that they need to be successful. Very simple. We do not charge for our services, so you come to us for as long as you wish to come to us. The other thing I want to tell you about is, since this is an export workshop, I am directly speaking to you, and Tanya is going to go into it a little bit more. We are putting together a trade mission, and that trade mission is going to Colombia and Panama, specifically for export and export opportunities to be pursued through there. So while you're listening to the comments today and what's going on today, know that that's an option as well that you may want to explore and you may want to talk to Pierre about at some point, or myself, and um, we will help you through that. We're only going to take, what, 10 companies, Pierre? 10 to 12. Yeah, we're only taking 10 to 12 companies, so, uh, and it, of course it'll be, it's going to be two things. It'll be first come, first serve, but it'll also be dependent on the in industry you're interested in doing business with. Okay, so it's two things. Um, I'm going to spend just 30 seconds just giving you a view, uh, an overview, because these people give their time to us. They get paid nothing for this. They come here to help you, to help the small businesses, and I want you all to know about that. It's, it's just great. You know, they could all be doing something else and being somewhere else, but they've chosen to be here to help the businesses, okay? So I'm going to start with Tanya. We all know Tanya very well. Tanya is a good friend of ours. Uh, she joined the U.S. Commercial Service in 2006 as a Foreign Service Officer, uh, Environmental Engineering Expert for the French Development Agency. She served in Africa, the Middle East, and South America, Bogota, Colombia. Um, she's a U.S. Commercial Officer serving New York and the Tri-State area. So she's, uh, she's the woman. Tanya. Tanya knows the stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Tanya knows her stuff. Uh, Pina is an attorney with DeLuca, Farrell, and Schmidt. She's co-chair of the New York Intellectual Property Law Association and is a member of the American International Property Law Association. Uh, she's registered to practice before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, Davey he has 24 years of experience in commercial banking and lending. Now, are, you, are you sensing a trend here? We have an attorney, we have a commercial person, we have uh, the banking, um, and she's a board member of the Long Island Import-Export Association. Uh, Arnold Kiglia is with Aspen Freight Forwarders. Ah, so now we close the loop. So now we have the freight forwarder as well, okay? He's a graduate of the World Trade Institute in international shipping. With that, I think my part is over. Good morning. Uh, thanks a lot for being here. Uh, we've demonstrated at least one thing so far, is that the amount of interest uh, in the, on Long Island for exporting is significant. <coughs> we have some objectives for for the, the session today. Okay, the first objective is to think of exporting to grow your market. Now, obviously, you're already thinking about exporting, so we'll we'll modify that a little bit. We'll say uh, we want you to think of exporting and add to it the type of stuff that you will have learned today in at the workshop. Learn, and you're going to learn firsthand from a local business, okay? And we've changed the name of the participant uh, to protect the innocents, but um, you'll get a live feel for what it is uh, to start thinking about exporting and to come to the SBDC for counseling and advice on exporting. Okay, so we'll give you a clear demonstration of, of the process. You come here, you get our assistance in uh, planning for it, in articulating that idea that's, uh, that's in your head about exporting. Uh, we help you through the planning and we also help you through the implementation of your plan if you want us to. We hope that after the session you will know what it takes to be a successful importer. Now, speaking of uh, the local field, the local business, I would like to introduce to you Ronnie Rosen, who is our volunteer business person. 
She is the founder and CEO of a company called Kids for Sports, and she's on Long Island. Okay? So this is Ronnie, and she's come to the SBDC for advice. She's thinking of expanding her market, as you would, um, as a business person who wants to grow their business. So I'm the advisor. I'm going to be speaking with Ronnie. Good morning, Miss. Rosen? Good morning. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Okay. You were here at the SBDC for the first time? Yes. Okay. Would you like to tell us about your business? Sure. Um, we've been in business over 20 years. My dad started the business um, and I took over. I'm kind of taking over the business now. And we've been doing business here in the States um, all this time. We've expanded from small, a small little business to now we have quite a number of employees um, and we do our manufacturing in Bayshore we have a distribution center and a warehouse in Bayshore and recently we also took um, space in Texas um, we're doing we have a warehouse a distribution center in San Antonio Texas um, we <coughs> expanded to the point where now we're doing business with the largest retailers uh, we do business with Dick's Sporting Goods we do business with Models and Sports Authority here in the East and all over. And in the West and the South, we do business at Cabela's and Bass Pro Shops, which are all throughout the rest of the country. So we're, we're quite large now, and um, we're thinking about expanding. Mm -hmm. um, we were on vacation with the family in Panama, and we thought that that might be a great opportunity. They have a, a need for sporting goods, and we thought that might be a good opportunity for us. And, perhaps also Columbia. That sounds great. What, what kind of sales volume do you have currently? Uh, about 12 million mm -hmm. is our, is our, was our uh, revenue for last year. Okay. All right. Great. Um, what, 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 what do you think we can do for you? What would you like us to help you with? Well, um, I need someone to help me coordinate our export efforts. Uh, we've never done this before. We don't know who to talk to. We don't know what to do about how the money exchange works. Uh, we don't how, know about how, about the, how about the issues that you're currently facing now? What do you mean? Uh, what, what are the challenges that your business is facing? That, that, that prompts you to think of export as, in, as not just an alternative, but an added um, solution to your issues. Hmm. Well, our margins are being compressed. We have uh, added competition now. Um, our products are made by many, many people throughout the country, so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of competition in that area, and the economy here in the states has gotten to the point where our sales are, you know, we've we've seen a little bit of a um, stress on our sales, and um, you know, we thought maybe it would be a good time for us to start exporting, okay. and and South America, Central America, seemed like a good first step. For okay, us. fine. What what kind of objectives do you have? What kind of what kind of goals do you have? Okay. Um, well, I'd like to, uh, we'd like to promote our, our brand so that when we do business overseas that people are familiar with our brand. Um, we think we have some very unique and very good quality products and we'd like to, we think we can do very well exporting them. Um, we'd like to um, increase our margins so if we can find a way to reduce the cost of, of our um, production that would be really great too. Um, and you know, uh, getting a big, bigger mar local market share would be also very good. That is that is that is great. Look, um, from from everything that that we've heard about, and can can gather from the profile of the company, um, it looks like this is a company that is that is ready to take advantage of um, historically lower transportation costs. Right? Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't cost as much to to export as it used to. There's a lot of reduction in cost. Um, I'm sure, I don't know if you've heard, but the two countries that you've actually mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, particularly Colombia and Panama, have uh, recently signed free trade agreements with the United States. Exactly. Which, which does a lot of things. It, it right. lowers barriers, trade barriers. It, mm -hmm. uh, it, it gets rid of tariffs and a lot of um, taxes that are imposed on uh, goods that are coming into those countries. So that, that in itself creates um, I an opportunity for businesses like yourself to at least explore right. what's which going on. Which is exactly why I'm here, because we've heard of this. And as I said, we were in Panama and we saw some of this. So 
you know, we really would like to take advantage of that. Uh, absolutely. Another advantage of, of exporting is, um, is reduction of dependency on local markets. It, it's a little bit like um, uh, diversifying your portfolio. Mm -hmm. So instead of uh, having all your customers in one basket, you're actually creating multiple baskets where you can have your customers, uh, your clients. Uh, it extends the product life of your business. And many times, uh, you may have a product that is hot here in this local market. Mm -hmm. Your introduction of that same product in another market essentially uh, extends the life of, of, of the product. Yeah, we feel like we've saturated the U.S. market, so that's why we feel like it, we would be you know, better off going somewhere else now at this point. At least directionally, you, you're thinking the right way. Okay? Yes. Now, here, here, is, here is something not just for Ronnie, that's, that's for everybody. Okay? Mm -hmm. we, we are not going to tell you that exporting is for every business. Uh, you heard the profile of her company. Um, there are some conditions that unless you meet them, or when you do meet them, uh, those conditions enable you or increase your chances of being a successful exporter. Okay? Uh, we have a we have we have a tick mark here of what what you need. This is these are the basics of what your company needs. And if you have it, great. If you don't have it, at least you know what it is that you are the what you, it is that you have to work towards in order to become um, a potentially successful exporter. A you have to be successful in the domestic market. In other words. You are starting here, and you have a product. It is, it is more likely that you're going to be successful overseas if you are at least partially successful here. So you do have to be successful in the domestic market. Um, in order to go overseas and be successful, you do have to have very clear <coughs> goals and a very clearly articulated strategy. That's important. You, you sort of have to have the goal marks there this is what you're shooting for and be very clear about uh, about the costs and benefits of your strategy. Um, you have to have the production capacity. If you are at capacity, um, exploring, exporting is more costly because now you have to invest capital in order to increase your capacity. If you're, already pro if you're producing a thousand um, soccer balls, okay, uh, to, to keep to the example that we've just heard, um, and you're selling 900 soccer balls. And uh, if you plan on going overseas, you have to think, well, well how are you going to produce the extra capacity, the extra demand that you're trying to build up? How are you going to produce that? So now you need capital investment. So having extra capacity is a good indicator that um, you are likely to be successful if you start generating more demands from overseas. Financial resources to market abroad. Uh, there is there is money to be spent in order to, to go abroad. You have to you may have to tweak your labels. You may have to do a, a certain number of things that will make you marketable someplace else. So there's definitely money to be spent. It's not a cookie cutter. You do it here and you do it there, and therefore you're going to be successful. Um, management must be on board. In the case of Ronnie. Management is clearly on board. She is the CEO of the company. Um, if she decides this is what she wants to do and she has the management depth to do it, fine, management is already on board. But if you are a company that has uh, different owners, multiple managers, you have to make sure that everyone is on board because this is not a, this is not a sprint. This might be like a, a, a longer race than let's just go down there as if we're on vacation, meet a couple of people, and bingo, we're in business. It, it usually doesn't work that way. Okay, so just wanted to add this 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 word of of, of reality to um, to what one needs to actually be a successful exporter. Pierre, this may be a little premature, but tell me about this part. Um, if I go down to, if I export there, is there a possibility that someone can explain to me about warehousing and distribution, or maybe even production in the other countries? Ab absolutely, absolutely. Um, <laughs> the, the wheel, I, I'm going this to introduce you to someone um, who will talk to you about how do you make contact with mm -hmm. any contact. How do you how do you actually go out there, uh, not knowing anybody in Colombia or Panama? 
and actually make the contact? Do you call them on the phone? Do you text them? Do you what do you do? You get off the plane, you don't know anybody there. How do you what what do you actually do? If in fact you are ready and you had ticked off all the markers, right? So you're completely ready. Now we're saying ready, get set, but don't go yet. Get a team of people. The reason why you have to get a team of people is because you need them to manage the complexity of what you're going to be doing. Uh, exporting has different parts to it. There are different things to be considered. You need a team of people that will become your advisors in this endeavor, in this adventure, uh, which, which is likely to be profitable given um, the, 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 the markets, given the fact that your product will be successful, people like it, or whatever. But you need that team of people. What we've done this morning is we've put together a team of people, okay? And we are at step one of our presentation now. Ronnie is meeting with me, I'm at the SBDC. And I'm, I'm looking at her company, I am uh, advising her about her readiness to, to, uh, to export. But the second step is we're gonna meet with a US commercial uh, service officer. Uh, these are the folks that are down there at our embassies, and their job is to help Americans um, sell in those countries, okay? Uh, the, the, then we're going to say, okay, fine, so now that you know where you want to go and you have a product, do you just jump and go there? Well, you may need to speak to an attorney. You, you should get legal counsel. First, you have, you have trademark issues. You have all kinds. You have con contract issues. You have all kinds of issues that you should have someone who is an expert at, at this type of things uh, to advise you on what you should be doing. And then, now you need money to do it. Um, not only do you need money to do it, let's just assume that you are wildly successful, okay? And you get this huge order. Now, there's, there's one minor consideration that you may want to think about. How the heck are you going to get your money? How, how are you going to get paid? Uh, you don't know these people, right? And they won't pay you until they get the product. So how are you going to get your money? These are services that a banker can offer you. And we have a banker here who is totally experienced uh, to talk to you about that. Now that you figured out how you're going to get paid, you have to figure how you're going to get your stuff from here to there in one piece. That's the freight forwarder's job, um, to make sure that the logistics, the transportation is assured and is, is not only assured but is in conformity with the terms of payment that the banker has arranged. Okay, so there's, there's, there's some complexity in there, and you do need a team of people to help you manage that. Okay, Ronnie, we have put together a team for you. Okay, Gloria already introduced them. Okay, we have Tanya Cole of the U.S. Commercial Service. We have Pina Campana. Uh, she's an expert in intellectual <coughs> property law. Uh, we have uh, Davy Trapelis. Um, she's an SVP at Citibank and she does commercial banking. She has 24 years of experience in commercial banking. And we have Arno Siglia, who is uh, a managing partner at uh, Aspen Freight Forwarders. So, we're going to follow the order of, of advice. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get out of the way and I'm going to invite um, Tanya to speak with you in terms of and talk to you about you know, how do you go to Colombia? How do you what do you do there? What are the services that the US commercial service can offer you before you get there and also when you are there. Okay? And this is the way it works at the SBDC. So if I come to you, you you'll introduce uh, me. To I, all I, these I, absolutely. At the SBDC we we're not we're not allowed to, to recommend one person to you. And and if we are gonna recommend people we'll we'll recommend at least three people from whom you can choose. But yes, we will, at, we will at least tell you the type of expertise you need okay. to carry on and implement the type of stuff that you want to do. Great. As, and, and on this note, I'll introduce Tanya Cole. Okay. Hello. Hi, Tanya. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Here's my card. Do you have a card? Oh, thank you. 
Uh, yes, I do have a card. I'll give that to you in a moment. Okay. And um, <laughs> do you also have a website? Uh, well, yes, we do have a website. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect these questions, but yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'll phone you our website. Okay. Um, I'll just mention that with commercial service, one of the things that we do to initial, do initial screening of uh, companies because as I said, I'm a commercial officer and I'm connected, I'm here in Long Island with the U.S. Export Assistance Center. So I'm working with companies locally to help them export internationally. Okay. Normally I'm out in the field. In other words, if you were to go on one of what we call our trade missions, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, you would actually meet me at an embassy and I would be managing a local staff with an embassy. And local staff means those are country nationals in that particular country for example, you mentioned you have an interest in Colombia and mm -hmm. Panama. So we have a team of local people who are Panama nationals or Colombian nationals who work there, who speak the language, who understand the culture, who would be able to assist you with you being able to export internationally. So you've already vetted these people and you know that these are the people that I have to Well, these are our people that work in the U.S. Embassy. So okay. to work in the U.S. Embassy, you okay. have to be vetted. Okay. And then I would be the commercial officer that would manage this group. So we're kind of what we, uh, we, we would call the bridge mm -hmm. between the local staff and also uh, the companies, the U.S. companies. Now, I understand, thank you very much, I understand that uh, I don't, I understand that you actually indicated you have manufacturing um, here, here on the yes. island yes. and also do you have manufacturing in, was it in Texas or? Uh, no, we have a distribution center. Distribution. All of our manufacturing is done here. Okay. So you manufacture U.S. products here. Yes. Okay, so that makes those products more than 51% content, which is another criteria that we have. Whereas if you were working with Pierre here at the Small Business Development Center, they do not have the 51% content rule. But the 51% content rule to use our services because we are a federal agency which is paid by your taxes. Yes. So you want to make sure you're getting your dollars okay. worth, right? Mm -hmm. This, our services are exclusively reserved to U.S. companies. Now, you could meet the 51% content rule in different ways. In your case, you manufacture mm -hmm. here. So that's 51%. We know that it's U.S. US uh, products and services. Mm -hmm. I, I do have a situation where I have a company that may source raw material from another country. Let's just pick a country. Let's just say they source raw material from Colombia. Okay. But they assemble that raw material. They mm -hmm. formulate it. And a good example might be, um, let's take perfume. Let's just say that they source the flowers or something from Colombia. I know Colombia has a, uh, a very um, flor, fl yes, a fl uh, flower industry, uh -huh. right? And let's just say they took flowers from there and for those flowers they made, you know, the oils. And then they formulated the perfume here on Long Island. And that's not very far from reality because we do actually have Estee Lauder or company like that that might make a product like that. Okay, and so they formulated it on Long Island. That means that the labor that to formulate the perfume or the product is here on Long Island. The actual services to sell it, marketing, production, um, shipping, packaging is done here. And with those different items, that would equal more than 51% U.S. content. So I just wanted to clarify that. That's, I think that's very important. So now that we understand that you meet those initial requirements, you have a website. <coughs> website is important. Why is that? Would you buy from someone who doesn't have a website? Would you just buy, you know, just call them up in the market and they said, okay, I have a sporting goods company, right? So how would you be able to track them? How would you be able to, you know, to make sure that they are a reliable business? So that's one of our initial vetting process. I, I understand also that you've been in business how long? 20 years. 20 years. So that makes you a very, very solid company. In some cases, I get people who say, well, I just retired and I want to go into business and I think I want to export. And that's a little bit more difficult. So now that you've been in business for 20 years, it's not to say that everyone should be in business for 20 years. I have some companies who have been in business only for one year, but they also are doing a business where they have five to 10 years experience. A good example is, is if you opened up a sporting goods business, right, and you decided to branch off from this business and do something that was related. Maybe it would be fit a fitness center. Okay. okay, so you have 20 years in the sporting goods industry, 
Right, so that's transferable to the fitness industry. So in that case, even though you might have been in business only from six months to a year, you still have a good potential to be export ready. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're getting at, trying to get you export ready, meaning exporting to another market. So, and I understand also your business is growing. What was the growth between, I would say, over the last five years? Uh, we went from um, $8 million to $12 million in revenue. Right, so, and, so in that case then, we, that demonstrates that you have expertise and experience and you know how to manage your business. Now some of the things that become a little bit more tricky when going exporting internationally is supply chain management. Mm -hmm. And that means getting the goods and services from point A here on, on Long Island, moving it over to your warehouse, and then shipping it out to the particular country. Pierre has told me that you're interested in South America. Yes. So you were on a trip in South America in Panama, right? Yes, what made right. you interested in South America? You mean as a trip or as a place to sell As a goods? place to sell your goods and services. <laughs> well, when I, when I was there, I, I thought that it might be a potential area, and I did, some, um, I did some communicating with people before I left, some Panamanians that I know who work for us, um, salespeople, and I just thought I would make contact with some people down there. When I was there, I kind of put my feelers out. It seemed like a good place to go. So you've actually contacted people that you have had some relationship with with yes. your business. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's really important because that takes us to the next step. To do, and, and I'm stepping through this fairly quickly because I could spend a whole day on this, as you know. <laughs> but just to give you an indication, it's, if you want to export internationally, one of the most important things is to have a local partner. Now, why is that important? Do you speak Spanish, by the way? No, very little. Un poquito. Ah. Okay. So, you want to export into a market where you don't necessarily speak the language, right? So now, a local partner becomes extremely important. A local partner can tell you a little bit about the culture. They can tell you about who to do business with, who not to do business with. Uh, they can tell you about your competition because you mentioned that you manufacture here in the Day states sure, yes, yes. right so your competitors which i can tell you fairly quickly because i've already read the country commercial guide which we'll come back to um are going to be chinese and there are com com um, considerable amount of chinese products that will be what we call on that market, and, and I was going to use the word dumped in the market, but that might not be the best for <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say considerable amount of project uh, products that are in the market. So that's going to make it very um, challenging. challenging for you from a price point. Mm -hmm. So one yes. of the things that you need, I, I would suggest that you may want to do, we don't say that you need to do, I'm a real diplomat as you can see at heart, mm -hmm. one of the things that you may want to consider, and I always tell you this, we have a site called expert.gov, okay, and if you go on expert.gov, and a lot of people don't do the homework, because this is part of getting expert ready, is to know your market, where should I go and why should I go there, and if you go on expert.gov, you can click on Panama, and on Panama, on the bottom, you go, you would scroll down to the bottom, and it would say domestic sites, international. You click on international, and I wish I had that up there, but you know, it's a fairly easy thing to do. Expert.gov. Expert with an E R T. Export. Export. Export.gov. At the end of the, at the, end oh, okay. of the presentation, there's a link to it. Great. At the, if you, if, once you nav navigate through the website, you will be an expert. Okay. And so, if you scroll down to the bottom, international, and you click on international, you click on Panama, right? You will be able to find on the left-hand side, because I've memorized this, I don't ask you to do something that I haven't done myself, uh, what we call Country Commercial Guide. And it's exactly that. The Country Commercial Guide will give you background information about doing business in that country. It will talk about financial. It will talk about where the competitions are, competition is. It will talk about um, cultural aspects, what, um, how important it is to speak the local language. And if you don't speak the local language, what types of translators will be available for you? The other thing that it will do is it will list the five best prospects so that you will have an indication initially if your goods are going to sell in that market. Okay, so that's the first step. 
And the reason why I say to do that is because I always say no before you go. Do your homework before you go in. Okay, so you click on the country commercial guide, and I'm getting the signal there. We're going to move through the time. And um, that will give you an indication of what this market means for you. Is this it's initially a potential market for you? The other thing that you can do is, if you click on there, they'll have market uh, research reports. And I'm not, not necessarily that they'll have a research report for your particular industry. Now that comes back to our services. Now, Small Business Development Center services are free. I don't want to say, I say unfortunately, but in some ways fortunately, our services are fee-based service. So what we can do if, if you do not have a local partner, we can help you find a local partner. We have a service called the International Partner Search. And what that does is we profile your background. You come through me. I send an email to, to Panama, for example, or it could be Colombia as well. And what we can do is we can say, is there a good market for this particular client? And then the people who are there in the embassy, remember the local staff will come back, our specialists, trade specialists, who usually these guys have an average of 10 to 15 years you know, on the ground, will say, yes, we think there's a, a, a particular potential, or no, there isn't, and this is why. Mm -hmm. And that's going to save you time and money. And in some cases, they'll say, there's not a potential here because we have a regional approach. You know, So who's ever in Panama is doing Colombia, who's doing the next market, um, um, you know, the, the next region and area, and they'll say, but we think your product might sell better in Colombia. Okay, so that's one of our services. The other thing that we have is called the Gold Key Client Service, where if you didn't have a partner, you can actually go down and try to sell to the end users. And an example is you would sell your product directly to a sporting goods, you know, um, store mm -hmm. in the country. All right? So there's that option as well. We have other things that we can do for you. We can do a market research report for you. And these are all fee-based. And the fortunate thing about this is that these, this is not something that's very expensive. Um, we're talking for GoKey in the order of $700 for the international oh. partner search. Uh, we're talking $600. This is for small business enterprises, which is why I asked you how much. And then I have to run through this very quickly, though. We can also help you with contacts with legal issues because you want to protect your brand, but there's my colleagues here who are going to talk about you know, patents, trademarks, and copyrights. And I can tell you in Colombia and Panama, these are great markets because these are free trade agreement markets. Yes. What does that mean by free trade agreement? Is that you basically, and right now for sporting goods, you are at 0% duty, meaning that you can move your goods and services across the border and you're not going to have the duty on that. All right. And at the other, at, and free trade agreement markets also have some intellectual property rights protection, meaning protection of your brand. Right. Um, you know, but that's something I'll leave to my colleagues because for, for the legal ramifications, it's a little bit more involved. Mm -hmm. But you've already picked a good market. And then the last thing I wanted to say is commercial service. We have trade missions that go down to Colombia. In fact, you are so lucky because at the end of this year, we're mm -hmm. looking at a trade mission to Panama and Colombia. So you get two for one mm -hmm. at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> and that trade mission would actually have the gold key service factored in. Oh, so you would have an opportunity not just to drop out of the sky, get off the airplane and say, oh my God, hola, que tal? What am I doing right now? All right. You will be with a group of companies. And so, and that's going to better your profile and that's going to leverage your brand in terms of making partners. Thank you very much. Oh, that's Thank you. wonderful. Thank you. Can I just say a resource of the Small Business Development Center that you also do not pay for is we have a group of librarians up in our central office whose sole purpose it is to do research for you. So they will do market research. It will cost you exactly what everything else has cost you up till now, and that is zero. So when you're working with your counselor and you want to do research into various markets, they will help you with that. They will guide it. They will do a lot of the research for you. Sure. Since, since we were talking about Latin America, just very quickly for about a minute, and here are some facts and figures about that market. If you're running a business in the U.S., you need to know the Hispanic market is the fastest growing group of consumers. I'm talking about close to 50 million men, women, and children from diverse communities at every level of the socioeconomic strata. 
that's 16% of the total population, or one out of five US residents. But here's the real number you need to know. Recent statistics show that Hispanics account for at least half of US population growth. I do believe it's a market every successful business will need to embrace. You don't need an expert to tell you that if your customers speak Spanish, you should communicate in Spanish. But it's much deeper than that. I'm concerned that businesses don't have all the resources they need to make informed decisions, and smart decision making is key. American ingenuity and innovation are the foundation of our economy. But companies need customers, and competition for market share is more and more intense. Take action to address the U.S. Hispanic market and you'll be instantly rewarded, here and in 20 countries worldwide. Engaging this worldwide market is smart decision making, and it's essential to take your business to the next level. If you combine Hispanics in the U.S., Mexico, Spain, and all the Spanish-speaking countries of Central and South America, you have a total worldwide Spanish-speaking market in excess of 450 million people, 150 million more than the population of the United States. A majority of the Spanish-speaking population lives in Latin America, a region that has tripled in population since 1950. Three out of four within this demographic live in rapidly growing urban areas with expanding economies growing in lockstep with regional infrastructure. The growing U.S. Hispanic market is a sign that companies can no longer ignore Latin America. Our neighbor in the Western Hemisphere, Latin America, is comprised of 20 countries in North, Central, and South America, with a population close to 600 million. That's twice the population of the United States and two-thirds of the entire Western Hemisphere. Latin America is an important emerging market that has been largely ignored by global corporations until now. Why? A lot of it has to do with the perception that the market isn't viable or that the infrastructure doesn't exist. In fact, most cities in Latin America have levels of infrastructure and technology similar to any city in the United States. Latin Americans commute to work in new cars, enjoy world-class shopping malls, live in suburban housing developments, shop at grocery stores, and conduct business and life in much the same way as we do in North America. Whenever I take someone to Latin America for the first time, they are usually surprised by how similar it is to our own way of life. Business people from around the world are already busy in Latin America negotiating purchase agreements for commodities and making investments to support local infrastructure development. The growing cities of Latin America have new highways, new airports, new buildings, new shopping malls, and a youthful population with an appetite for more of the goods and services we already enjoy in the United States. Hispanic Latin America imports more than $1 trillion worth of products each year, and the United States has only a modest 26% market share. I think we can do better, and it all starts with the U.S. Hispanic market. Once you've addressed the Hispanic market here, you are well on your way to reaching more than 450 million Hispanic customers worldwide. Take small steps to serve your customers in their own language. Be sensitive to their cultures, and you will make your business more global and increase your potential. Doing this is easier than you might think. Okay, one side note, uh, in terms of going anywhere, okay, of course, and, and it's worth repeating, you, you do have to consider your base cost, right? I mean, you, it'll cost you something. Um, and they are, of course, that are specific to import and export. These are the kind of things that you go through when you're doing the actual planning, okay, the, the financial plan for whatever export endeavor that you want to be engaged in. Okay, so... <clears throat> Now that you know everything about uh, the U.S. commercial service, uh, it's time for me to introduce you to Kina Campania, mm -hmm. who is our expert in uh, intellectual property. She'll tell you about uh, what you ought to know about your trademark and how to protect yourself. Hello, hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Here's my card. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a public learner. <laughs> On the website. You know. <laughs> First, I'd just like to say thank you for considering our firm. Uh, we are about 40 patent attorneys, all of different technical backgrounds, mechanical, electrical engineering, computer science, um, biochemistry, and um, as Gloria said, I'm a patent attorney there, my background's in biochemistry, but I also do a lot of trademark work and design patent work. Um, I know we were considered step three on the chart here, but really we need to get involved as early on as possible. Um, because it's, it's really important, especially when there's new product development or new processes that are, you know, for manufacturing certain goods, um, typically, 
when someone <coughs> comes to me or calls me and says, you know, I think it's time, I need an IP attorney, um, IP being intellectual property, and covers, you know, patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade dress, um, <coughs> they would have some sort of new idea, um, they think they might have made an improvement of what are, whatever's out there in the, the market already. Um, and they want to make sure that they can get protection for it before they start manufacturing or selling it or even selling it overseas. Um, so with sporting <coughs> goods, um, there might be a new process of making perhaps a baseball bat or, you know, that, that might not have been discovered before and you might want to seek protection for that. Or there might be a really uh, new and ornamental design of um, a soccer ball that you're, you've created and you want to protect the overall design aspects of that. In addition, when you're creating new brands, mm -hmm. so when you're calling your products new, new things, you want to make sure you can get protection for them in, you know, with the trademark office. Well, we do. We have um, you know, kids for sports. And right. That's a so brand that, that we use on a lot of for our your, shirts <laughs> and our, our products. Right. So <laughs> for kids for sports, you would definitely, you know, consider talking to a trademark attorney or if you have a, a trademark registration for it already, that's great. Um, <coughs> but if you didn't, you know, we would we would help you in, in making sure that we could clear the mark, make sure that no other marks are being used that are similar to the mark that you've chose, chosen to use for your business or for any of your products. Um, so, you know, typically that would be the first step with trademarks, but I'm, I'm going to you know, start with, with patents and, and just talk a little bit about, you know, important considerations. Um, so if you, if you came to us with an idea that you thought that might be patentable, um, we would start off by doing a patentability search. And so what, what, what does the patent cover? The design of the product? The, there's different the process, patents. Yes. There's utility patents, mm -hmm, there's right. design patents, there's also plant patents. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so the utility patents covers the, you, you, the functional aspects of a product. So if something functions or has an improvement over something um, that's already in the market, you would want to consider perhaps getting a, a utility patent on it. Design patent only covers the ornamental features of the pat of, of the the product. So there's you know d different options so that if a product you had wasn't protectable under utility, it's possible that it might have a unique design to it. We might want to explore doing a design patent. Um, so the patentability search up front will determine what's out there, what's already been patented, are you likely to infringe someone else's patent if you go ahead and produce this new product. Um, so we want to take a look at that up front. Typically, if, I know Pierre asked me to bring in costs, so we, you know, give you an idea of what the cost would be. Um, a patentability search can range anywhere from $500 for a, a simple, quick, let's try, you know, try to find a quick knockout search to about $4,000 if it's more complex, if we're looking at more of like a manufacturing process, you know, it might get a little more complex and we have to do a lot more digging. Is there any part of that that we can, that I can do Yes, myself? there is, and I was just going to mention that. Um, actually, google.com slash patents has got a great database of patents and you could just do simple keyword searching. So if it's a new <coughs> soccer ball, you know, you put in soccer ball and if it has certain features to it, you might want to add extra words so you don't get a million hits. Mm -hmm. But um, so that would be something you can do up front before even talking to us because it's possible you may find something and then, you know, move on to the next thing. Um, so that is actually a resource I use, Google Patents. Um, for my quick searching. We subscribe to other databases, but that's something I usually start off with to do a quick search. Um, so I would definitely recommend that. Um, so we talked about the cost for the patentability search. Now once we decide <coughs> that the product is in, in fact patentable and we want to draft patent applications for you, um, the costs get a little bit more expensive, but there are ways that we can try to keep the cost down up front 
so that you have time to perhaps get more investments um, and gain more revenue, you know, it, up, you know, a little bit later on so that we could cut the costs up front. So there are two different applications there for utility. There's a provisional application and a non-provisional. The provisional application is basically something that we put together with as much as information as we have at the time um, to, to get it on file. The provisional application, it doesn't get uh, examined at the patent office. But one year from that provisional filing date, because it's basically the provisional process is used to get that filing date. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's really important that you don't disclose your ideas prior to filing that provisional application. Why is that? Because you can lose your rights to get a patent. Um, our system has just changed last September of 2012 to what's called a first to file system. So if if you're not the first to file on that particular invention and someone else filed before you, they can potentially win the patent. Um, there is you can, if you did disclose it prior to filing, there are, you get a grace period for filing your application. However, I usually try to always, you know, discourage disclosing because if you disclose it today and you file your application tomorrow, you also need to make sure you also have lost any foreign rights that you might have mm -hmm. had before disclosing. And when you say disclosing, what are you talking about disclosing? Um, to the public in like a, in a non-confidential So for example, type like of if I've talked to a, a, a retailer about carrying right. my product. Without a confidentiality disclosed. agreement, that would be considered right. disclosure. So it's really important um, not to disclose or have confidentiality agreements in place if you're going to go talk to outside um, <coughs> potential retailers and manufacturers or any of any entity. Um, so once you put an application on file, a provisional application, you have about one year to change it over to a non-provisional application. That's the application that's going to get examined at the, at the patent office. So hopefully within that one year, you've maybe we're able to find some investors um, because a patent application typically can cost anywhere from about six to ten thousand. So you have one year to, to explore the potential right. for your product. At that time, if you decide that product may not be successful, you're, um, you know, we can just, you can just drop the provisional application, let it expire, and not file anything else. And about how much is that cost? The provisional? The provisional, yes. Um, it can be about four thousand, mm -hmm. and then to, to file the, the full patent, how much yeah. is that? Could that cost? Uh, it would be a total of about eight to ten thousand. So if we did the provisional first, we would hope that a lot of that meat of the disclosure would be in the provisional already, and we just have to really, you know, fix it up to make it um, more presentable and and able to be examined by the patent office. Um, so, the, the key though, if for your international business, is that if you're going to be um, distributing to outside the U.S., it's important to consider whether you're going to file internationally as well because the U.S. patent application only covers you here in the U.S. Um, so, if you mentioned Panama and Colombia, you would probably want to consider filing in those countries that you're going to distribute your goods to, or if you decided to manufacture in another country, you would probably want to get protection in that country as well. Um, and also, what's important to consider with international filing is that you need to do it within one year of the U.S. filing date. So whether you Question. filed, she can do all the embassy in the consulates, or she or the person has to go to the countries to do that. Um, we we have to engage in local counsel in those countries in order to do the filings. However, <coughs> there is one option where we can file from one year from the U.S. filing date. What's called a PCT application. It's an international application, and we can file it here in the U.S. 
and what it does is it, it buys you more time. It buys you another 18 months after that to decide which countries you want to file in. So basically it's another placeholder in the system, but it's an international application and uh, I think it's over 70 countries are a party to that agreement of the PCT and once it's a total of 30 months once 30 months arrives from that initial filing date we need to start designating you the countries you want like Panama or Colombia whichever countries you want to file directly in um, PCT application is about four thousand dollars and the other option would be if you didn't want to do the PCT application because usually I recommend that if you're thinking of at least three or four countries to file in and you want to just file directly you need to file within that one year from the US uh, filing date so you would go and file an individual application in Panama or an individual application in Colombia. <coughs> PCT application keeps it open so that if during that time, 30 month time period, you decide you're gonna, you know, perhaps sell in Europe, you might wanna cover Europe as well. So the patent though is different from, uh, having a patent in your hand basically doesn't give you the right to give you any rights. It gives you the right to exclude others from manufacturing, making the product. So what we normally recommend once you, you've got this product, you're ready to launch it, we usually recommend also doing an infringement analysis. Even though you might get a patent on your product, mm -hmm. it's important to determine whether your product's going to also maybe perhaps infringe another person's patent because what's important in that aspect is to look at what's <coughs> being claimed by other entities in their patent applications. If, if your product meets the claims of other third parties that have a patent on a similar product, it's, there's the potential for infringement. So what we normally recommend is getting a non-infringement opinion from us um, which, which is where we do an analysis to, and a search to, to make sure you're not going to infringe other patents, as well as giving you an infringement, non-infringement opinion, and if you were some, somehow someday uh, sued by a third party that thinks you've infringed, your, infringed the product or their product, you would, could use that opinion in order to, so that you would avoid any triple damages for infringement. Um, so it, it's important to, to develop an IP portfolio because if you're looking for investments, typically investors will want to see that IP portfolio. Um, in addition, it just makes your <coughs> company more valuable if you're going to sell it. Um, so it's, it's really important to explore, even if utility patent is not available for you, you might want to consider design patents. So if there's no patentability with respect to the functional aspects of the product, the ornamental features of that product might be novel and unique and distinct, and you might want to protect it by a design patent. And it's fairly much cheaper to do it that way. A design patent's about $2,000. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually much quicker to get a patent by the design route at the, at the patent office about, it's right now it's taking about a year to get a design patent. For a utility patent, it could take up to four years. So another consideration is the life cycle of your product. If your product's life cycle is just a couple of years mm -hmm. until the new great, great improvement comes out that's much better than the product, the utility patent might not be any worth to you because if it takes that long to get it, you can't enforce your rights on an, against an infringer till you have that patent in hand. So that's another consideration, and I'm assuming in the sporting goods in industry, um, products are constantly being developed, improved, and the next best thing is coming out, and, and so you know that might not be mm -hmm. something that's 
uh, beneficial to the company, but a design patent might be. Um, I'm going to switch over to trademarks because mm -hmm. that might be really important to you, especially with the business name, any product names that you're going to come up with, logos, designs, um, those things should definitely be searched prior to using them um, because, again, there's infringement issues with trademarks as well. And it, the first thing that typically we would do is do a preliminary search to see if the mark is available for use and registration. Um, if you can also do some of the legwork up front. There's the website USPTO.gov, and it's very user friendly. You would just go to the trademark section and type in your mark and see if it comes up and see if anyone has anything similar. And, and if, if it's being used in a similar industry, there's some <coughs> potential issues. There might be some potential issues with that. So um, at least a preliminary sh search should be done. If you would like an attorney to do it, typically something like that costs about $400 for a preliminary search. And if you want a more comprehensive search done, a preliminary search typically just covers looking at federal registrations and doing an internet search. The comprehensive search will take a look at federal and state registrations. It'll take a look at business names, domain names, common law uses, and also internet uses. Typically a comprehensive search is about $1,500. I usually recommend those when you're launching a new product, when you're naming um, your company a new name, that's when I recommend doing the more comprehensive search because you really get an idea of what's out there. <clears throat> the other consideration when you're, before you even ch have chosen a, a mark for your goods, you want to stay away from descriptive terms. Descriptive terms um, typically are not protectable under trademark law and you will have a hard time enforcing them. So you want to come up with some more fanciful, fanciful or more arbitrary terms that really don't describe the product. Um, in For example, the, um, an example, an example <coughs> Canon is a, a trademark for, for cameras, and that's just a made up <coughs> term. It's not a dictionary word. So it, you know th that's a really strong mark. Um, you know, something that would even be almost generic would be soccer ball, or you know, that's a generic term, a descriptive term. Something like that is not protectable under trademark law, even if it's spelled differently. Even if spelled differently, mm -hmm. yes. In the United States, you have to use a trademark in commerce in order to have trademark rights. Mm -hmm. Outside the U.S., however. It's important that you file your applications first before use because outside the U.S. it's a first to file system. However, in the U.S. it's not a first to file system. The, the priority goes to the person that first started using the mark in the U.S. So if you decided to use your mark but not file an application, that's okay here in the U.S. because you need to do that anyway in order to get your trademark, federal trademark registration. But be mindful that it, outside of the US, if you're going to be exporting goods with the, pro, with the product name on it, with the mark on the goods or on the packaging, you want to file an application in those countries because someone else can do it first. And then you have to go through a battle with them to try to get it back. Um, so, same thing with uh, trademarks. There is a process where you can do an international <coughs> application, which costs a little bit less um, to do instead of filing in individual countries. It's called the Madrid application. And that's pretty much just a, a basic idea of you know what we could do to help you on the IP side and you know before exporting. And, and more even early on when you're, you know, begin your business. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes.